Good morning. It's good to be with you guys. I feel like I haven't seen you in so long. It's been 15 days we were on the road and on the side of the road, um, but we're home. Fourth of July. Don't get stuck on the side of the road on the Fourth of July. Nobody's open. Did you know that? Nobody was open. <laughs> I don't know, something was going on, I don't know, for fireworks, I don't know what was happening, something was going on. It's good to be home, though, it's good to be with you guys, like Pastor Rich said, my name is Travis, I'm the next generation pastor, and I get to hang out with um, the people who are crazy when they're little, and then, as he said, when you get a little older, the craziness just keeps on increasing, and in my opinion, that's a good thing, so I hope we're all um, doing some pretty crazy and wild things, um, yeah, so I'm grateful to be able to be with you. We've been working through the Sermon on the Mount. That's where we've been. We've been talking about Jesus reclaiming things, things that maybe we have taken out of context, things that we're really confident about, that we believe 100%. We have a belief. We have an understanding. We think we know exactly what we're talking about. And for centuries, they had talked about things a certain way. And now Jesus comes along and says, uh, you're wrong. And so for centuries, there's been a buildup to some of these things that Jesus is talking about. And so he says, you've heard it said this, I tell you this. We've seen it this way. Jesus establishes something new. That's been the pattern that we've seen throughout Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. This is his very first big message. This is his very first big public address. This is going to so many places. There are so many different people. So he's establishing a foundation for what would be the entirety of his ministry. He's setting a precedent for the way he's going to interact with the people of God in this message. This is a big deal. So all the things he's talked about are controversial, are difficult, and are big. He's talking about really big foundational ideas. Today we find ourselves in the book of Matthew chapter 7. We're nearing the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 7, we find a very, very extremely popular passage of Scripture about judgment. It says this, Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Anybody here heard that before? Anybody here heard that before? Okay. Almost everybody here has heard that. How many of you have quoted that before? So somebody will stop judging you. Anybody? Anybody want to claim that? <laughs> a, few, a few hands. Very good. Love the honesty. The people of this day were so obsessed with being right. Because right was rightness with God. If they did things right, if they believed the right things, if they did the right things, they had rightness with God, a right relationship with God, and therefore salvation and all of the promises that God had in store for them. And if they were wrong, they were cast out. They were pushed to the outside of the promises of God. There were consequences to their actions. So they were obsessed with this idea of judgment because they were obsessed with being right. Anybody here love being right? Anybody here love being wrong? Anybody here just really, it just really makes you happy when you're wrong. So you might say, well, sometimes I like being wrong. But I mean, like, it's just a general, I'm not saying, are you normally wrong? And then you look at your wife because she's like, yeah, that's right, you're always wrong. Like, I'm, I'm asking, do you genuinely find joy out of being wrong? Nobody does. Nobody finds genuine joy out of always being wrong. Neither did the people of God. And to them, it had eternal weight. I'm not just talking about like making a judgment call on somebody. We all should make judgment calls. If we're going to be in good, healthy relationships, at some point in time, we have to make a judgment. If you're married in the room, you made a judgment on somebody a long time ago, whether you regret that choice or not is beside the point. You made a judgment call on a relationship. Maybe it was a friendship. So we make judgment calls, and it's an important part of, of, of this living right relationships with other people. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about something of eternal weight and significance, of somebody's value to God or society. That's what this is talking about, something deeper, because that was where the society was. That was the weight they put on it. But did you notice, though, that the people of God who were obsessed with being right, especially in the gospel, were often found um, making wrongful or hurtful choices by Jesus? They thought they were doing right. It wasn't just, oh, well, I just thought wrongly about that. And they, like, took it to the extreme, and it was causing more harm than good. But the other thing we find here is that man's judgment is not the only judgment at play. Do not judge 
um, or you too will be judged, right? Um, but this idea, this phrase here, the measure you use, it will be measured to you. In my study, I found out that this does not refer to the person, the person who's judging you, it refers to God measuring it back to you. That there's an element here where do not judge or you will be judged, that's people together. The measure with which you use to judge other people, it will be measured to you. In other words, God's a part of this equation when it comes to human relationships as well. That God is, an, is a being who makes choices and has a will and executes judgment of his own in regards to relationship. That when it comes to the way we live in relationship with other people, God makes a judgment call. Well, that could be frightening for many people. As a matter of fact, that has probably been an idea that's been used to abuse and manipulate other people. Not probably. Let me rephrase that. It is used to abuse and manipulate other people. So that's a little bit of a situation there where when we take a look at this idea that God is measuring and levying judgment against us or with us or in the midst of us, whether it's good judgment, bad judgment, he's levying his judgment. It'd be a very unnerving idea. If you think about judgment in the way that we've typically thought about judgment, but Jesus is about to reclaim this idea of judgment and give us something far greater. Have you guys ever heard the phrase, only God can judge me? I used to hate that phrase. You know that? I used to be like, oh, that's a ridiculous notion. Of course, people judge you all the time. But then I began to realize what people meant when they said that. They meant that when it comes to something of eternal significance, I default to God's judgment. I default to how God sees me. And that is where I think we find our hope. In Matthew chapter 7, 3 through 5, we move on. He says this, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? Pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. Great image, by the way, plank of wood sticking out of an eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. Speaking of eyes, if I were to ask Kaylin to come up on stage, and I were to hand her an apple, and I were to tell her to come over here, and balance the apple on her head, and I were to come over here, and I were to grab a compound bow and arrow, those of you who hunt, and I were to say, okay, Kaylin, stand over there, I'm going to shoot the apple off your head. She might kind of trust me, she might be like, well, he hunts, he probably wouldn't ask me to do this, but if I were to then turn around <coughs> and take these bad boys off, <laughs> Stand still. Quit moving. Why are you moving? Why are there two apples? She would immediately run. Would she not? Would any of you just stand there and be like, go ahead, do it. I don't even care anymore. Right? Like, of course she would not trust. Of course she wouldn't trust me. She'd be like, wait a minute, time out. Do I have to do this, Rich? Do I have to do that? Like, she would be asking those questions because she knows all of a sudden I can't see clearly. Y'all are just like blurs with points. Like, that's all you are right now. I can't even see any faces. I'm nearsighted. I can't even see this right now. That's how blind I am, right? Seeing clearly is a very important part of this equation. And what Jesus does in reclaiming judgment is he says, instead of sitting there with a plank in your eye, saying, here, let me remove that speck out of your eye, he says, first, move the plank out of your own, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck out of your neighbor's eye. The promise in reclaiming judgment is that Jesus offers us clarity. He doesn't say we're going to be no longer subject to judgments of any kind. He promises us that there is something we are not seeing clearly at the moment. Otherwise, he wouldn't have to tell us that we could see clearly because we'd already see. He, the promise is that you will see clearly. Clarity will be received when Jesus reclaims the idea of judgment. He's not saying not to make judgment calls. He's saying when it comes to this idea of eternal judgment, when it comes to how judgment interacts in relationship, you should adopt the way that I judge. You should remove the plank out of your eye so that you can see how things really, truly do operate. In other words, we currently don't see things as clearly as we think we do. 
And certainly at the time, with thousands of people gathered around him, some of them extremely religious leaders who have spent their time using judgment as a stick to beat down, taking the plank out of their eye and beating the snot out of people, Jesus says, put the plank down. Put it down and see clearly. It's a gift to see clearly. And this is not just about judgment when it comes to other people either. How many of us, when we look in the mirror, don't even see ourselves clearly with a plank in our eye? How many of us make judgment calls on ourselves? Our value, our worth, how Jesus sees us in the mirror. Anybody here just love what they see in the mirror? Don't answer that question. We all look in a mirror every single day and we could probably all find something we don't like about ourselves externally or internally. Judgment calls that people have made about us with planks in their eyes, not seen clearly, have passed judgment, putting a speck in our eye, and now all of a sudden nobody sees clearly. Nobody sees anybody the way that Jesus intended. That's why he reclaims judgment here. The whole eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth thing that, that myth of, of retributive, viol- of, 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 I can't even say the word right, of violence, right? That he takes that away. We talked about that a couple months ago. It's similar this way. He takes that judgment away. He takes that judgment away. If we can acknowledge that we don't have it all figured out and never will, we can see clearly to remove the barriers between God and man and between us and other people. In reclaiming judgment, Jesus offers us Clarity. It is his desire that we see each other clearly and see ourselves clearly. But he doesn't stop there. Verse 6, do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Amen. When we pass judgment on others without seeing clearly... We are likely to throw the kingdom of God into spaces where it will not be received for the pearl that it really is. If I take a perfectly grilled steak and I feed it to my dog, some of you might say, well, good for you. But if I then turn around and pour dog food into a bowl because I gave the steak to my dog and I give it to my son Davis, who might actually eat it, but he won't touch mashed potatoes, figure that one out. You would sit there saying, why am, I, why am I throwing my steak to my dog? Why, why would I do that? She doesn't appreciate what she's eating. She's just eating. You know how I know she doesn't appreciate what she's eating? Because she eats garbage. Literally. If we leave a bag, which reminds me there's a bag in our house, which means when I get home, guess what? I'm probably going to have to clean up garbage in the house. Literally just remember that, right? Like I know for a fact that she does not have the ability to comprehend the gift that I'm giving her. She doesn't understand. There are people in our lives who we make judgment calls on eternally, and we try to hand them the kingdom of God, and they don't see it clearly, and they don't understand it, and they don't receive it very well. There are people who have been hurt countless times by the church, and when we try to offer them Jesus, all they see is the planks that have been used to beat them up. And not only do they not receive it well, sometimes they turn and attack because of the way judgment has been used. Because of the fact that we thought, I'm saying we in a general sense, not we, you, and me. I'm not making that call today. What I'm saying is like in general, you and I all know people who say they love Jesus and are going to love their neighbor, take that plank right out of their eye and smack somebody over the side of the head with it. And now that person is wounded. They're hurt. And anytime you come near them with Jesus, all they see is a plank coming out of somebody's eye right at them. And some people learn how to defend themselves. And you may be coming with the best of intentions. You may even be seeing clearly. Anybody here tried to remove a splinter from a toddler before? How hard it is to get, the, to get them to sit still while you'd remove the speck and they start like swatting away and smacking you and kicking you and all kinds of things. Because it hurts. Amen, right? Because it hurts. It hurts. No matter your intentions, it still hurts. And sometimes they hurt you in the process of trying to help them. 
So Jesus paints this reality. He says, if you take the kingdom of God and you put it into a certain context, there are going to be people who do not receive it well. They do not see clearly. They do not intend to see this the way that you're intending it to be. And you need to be mindful of that. That's why you take the time to see clearly so that you can remove the speck out of their eye. Why? So that when you offer them a pearl of great price, they will see it for what it is. They will see it for what it is. They will receive the good news. The good news. Clarity leads others to Christ. When you are clear, when you have clarity in and of yourself, this requires you to do an emotional or spiritual inventory for yourself. This requires you to sometimes get some professional help to do so. To say, I've got, I've got a plank in my eye. When people come to me with certain things, man, I react in, in defensiveness. I need to figure out what in the world's going on. Once we take that inventory of ourselves, we gain clarity. Have you ever had somebody who just seems to see you for who you are? You don't always agree about everything, but they just, they see you. They get you. They understand who you are. So much so that you're so comfortable that you receive almost anything they hand you because you trust them, because they see you clearly. That's what leads people to Jesus. But if we're not going to choose to be transparent, if we're not going to choose to remove the plank out of our own eye, all we're going to do is walk around knocking people in the head with our face. The extension of our faith. The church at large has understandably suffered judgment. As for so long, i got to tell you, the church has a pretty bad reputation amongst people who do not know Jesus. Did you know that? And it is not because they just refuse to see the value. If you hear people's stories and their experiences and you truly want to see clearly, you will understand they've been beaten up, broken, by people who said they followed the way. Just like the people in Jesus' day did too. But our clarity will lead others to who Jesus really is. And I believe Jesus has made a difference in your life, has he not? You can probably go back to the exact time he did. You could probably go back in your mind to the place where Jesus made all the difference in your life for the very first time. It's part of the reason why many of you are sitting here today. You see him clearly. But it's about continuing to submit ourselves to the work. Removing that plank to lead ourselves to Jesus again. To lead others to do the same. But the promise of seeing clearly here is also followed up by another promise. Ask, it'll be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you for everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. To the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? If you want clarity, you will find it. It's not, a, okay, try and get the plank out of your eye. Good luck. Peace out. See you later. He's saying, if you want the plank out of your eye, I am here to help make that happen. And if you really want to see who Jesus is, you will see him. And if other people who have specks in their eyes take that speck out and they want to see Jesus, they will see him. Whether or not they're looking through your eyes, whether or not they're doing it your way or my way, they will see Jesus because Jesus is a being who can make choices of his own and he has said, when they seek me, they will find me. That is also a promise. In other words, God has given us everything we need in Christ Jesus to be able to hand back over the judgment that Jesus is reclaiming so that we can see clearly. Jesus wants us to see clearly. This tells us something else, that Christ always responds. When you seek him, you will find him. If you knock, the door will be open. If I, though I am imperfect and with a plank in my eye and do not see clearly, know how to give good gifts to my children in spite of all of that, how much more does God in heaven know how to give good gifts to those who ask him? That does not mean he's going to give you everything your heart desires. No, no, no. 
No, no, no. That's not how that works. God is not a heavenly vending machine, my friends. But if it's in line with seeing clearly, you betcha he's going to do that. Because when you remove all that judgment and you hand it back to Christ, you see how much he loves. And you and I are never the same, are we? The last verse of this little passage we have, verse 12, he says this, So at everything, do to others, you listening children? Do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. How many of you like to be judged? How many of you like to be bludgeoned with planks? Not a one. Do to others. I said that a lot on our family trip into the back seat. Cooper, do to others what you would have to do. We say this to our kids and somehow we get to be adults and we forget. Post on Facebook as you would have other people post on Facebook to you. Treat the presidential candidate the way you would want. See what I'm saying here, guys? Look, I know this seems very elemental, fundamental, elementary. That's what I was looking at. I was getting there. It's been a long trip. Do to others what you would have them do unto you. Would you want somebody to remove that plank out of your eye? Would you want to make sure they got their glasses on when they do it? Then ask God to help you see clearly. So that in everything you do and say will be a fulfillment of what God intended through the law and the prophets, which are made manifest in the person of Jesus Christ. He said, I am the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Those were his words, not mine. He said, if you want to know what this looks like, look no further than me. He's a righteous person who could have given any judgment he wanted to eternally, and it would have been true because he was God. And instead, he spent a lot of time taking planks out of people's eyes and specks out of people's eyes. Instead of condemning them to eternal damnation, he removed specks and planks so that they could see each other clearly because that is what he desires. He desires us to see people the way that he sees them as his children, as people he loves, as people he died for, as people he would die for all over again. Imagine what it would be like to live in a community where we spend all of our time removing planks and specks. Instead of pointing out planks and specks and condemning and othering, all the people with planks in their eyes go over here, all the people with boats in their eyes go over here, all the people with specks in their eyes go over here, all the people with golf clubs in their eyes go over here. Instead, we spend our time lovingly removing the planks in our eyes so that we can see clear. Imagine a community where that's the norm. Imagine real-life community church where when people walk into this space and spend enough time around us, all the planks, the specks come right out of their eyes. Imagine a place where people are seen clearly even with a plank sticking out of their eye because we've done the work of trying to see people the way that Jesus sees people. Imagine living in a world where that is the norm. What difference would that make in your marriages, in your kids' lives, in your grandkids' lives? It would make all the difference in the world, wouldn't it? It would change our community. It would radically change our community. It would impact your neighbors' lives with transparency, a genuine desire to see them for who they are. Can you see how, can you see how this would heal relational traumas? How it would bandage wounds from long ago. It would disarm people who are ready on the defense. Over time, they would lay their weapons and their shields down to be embraced by a loving father. My friends, what we find in this passage is that this is possible. It can and does happen. Because God is faithful to do it and has given us a call to remove planks and specks. He wouldn't call us to do it. If we weren't able to do it. And when we think we can't, he said, just ask. Ask and you will receive. Not, I'll open the door. I want this for you. It is my desire that this happens. Therefore, we must devote ourselves, Real Life Community Church, 
through the loving process of removing planks from our eyes and specks from other people's eyes, not so they'll be like us, so they'll be seen clearly and see clearly, the way that Jesus would have them be seen and see. So I invite you to embrace this process. As you gather in life groups this week, as you drive home and you tell your husband or your wife about the plank in their eye, it's supposed to be a joke, you can laugh. Or you can take it really seriously and be like, I don't know if I want to go that far. As you engage with Jesus and you say, okay, all right, I know I've got stuff. As you embrace this process, pray for each other and don't make so quick a judgment Give room for God to do a work. Give time for God to do a work. But it starts with us saying, okay, I've got a plank somewhere. I'm going to go find it. Just hope somebody can see clearly to help me take it out. And as we do that together, we will be transformed into a community where we see people clearly. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for being a God who sees us for who we are. There are no planks in your eyes. You see us the way you've intended us to be. You see us the way we are right now. You see the planks. You see the specks. You see our lack of vision, sometimes our lack of compassion. You see our judgment. And you still enter into it with us, and you still promise us, not only can we see clearly, but that you'll be there. And when we knock, you'll open the door. When we seek you, we will find you that you are also measuring judgment, and with your judgment, you've measured us grace. You haven't condemned us. You sent your Son into the world to save us from our brokenness. So, Father, as Real Life Community Church, may we embrace this idea of, of handing back over that judgment to you so that we can receive clarity, see people the way you see them, and see ourselves the way you see us so that we and the world may know who you are far more clearly than we do now. All these things we ask in your name. Amen. I'm dismissing, correct? Okay, apparently there's another song. Am I correct? Oh, that's right, benediction. I knew there was something else. Would you stand with me? I forgot to put it in my notes. That's why I totally forgot. We're going to read our benediction, our real life benediction, as we head out today to see a little more clearly. May the bond of peace of Jesus Christ go with us as we seek to love God as one. May he guide us in humility, gentleness, and patience as we love people as we have been loved. May the compassion of Jesus Christ be in us as we serve the world in word and deed. May he bring us together again, rejoicing as his children, as we live in real life with Christ. Go with Christ. We'll see you next week.